Some new faces on today's NFC West huddle. We have Kyle Kraska in Los Angeles, Joe Fonzi in San Francisco, and our faithful Robbie Baker in Phoenix. We are talking about all things NFC West. And Joe, I'm wondering if we've seen Frank, we've seen Bailey, and we've seen Keyshawn Ward. Did they put you on today because of that loss? <laughs> uh, that was a rough one <laughs> against the LA Rams. <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 we kind of drew straws here, and I guess I got the short straw. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I don't think there's any question if you look at that game and you say some of the most brutal losses in recent 49er history, uh, that one's got to be in the top five. There's no question about it. I mean, it was a game. It was a banged-up Rams team. The 49ers were banged up as well, but you know, they had a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter. Does that sound familiar? A couple of consecutive Super Bowls had a 14-point lead at two different times in that game, and then they just absolutely committed the kind of mistakes that you can't commit down the stretch. And as a result of that, they're they're one and two. They gave the Rams life. The Rams were threatening to go 0 and 3 to start the season, and all of a sudden now at 3 and 0, the Seahawks are on top. Everybody else one and two, and we've got an NFC West race. All right, Kyle Kraska, you must be good luck for the Rams. How did the Rams come all the way back to beat the 49ers, despite all the injuries that the Rams also have? Yeah, well, this is great to be with you and uh, Joe and Robbie. And uh, I'll just say this. We're back, baby. We are back. <laughs> That's the win that this Rams team needed to get going. And how did it happen? What happened? I'll tell you what. Sean McVay happened. Kyron mm. Williams, three touchdowns, happened. A fake punt. That happened. Guts, heart, determination. It all happened happened for the Rams and of course Jake the Shank Moody happened Ooh. as well do you realize that with a 10 point fourth quarter lead the 49ers had a 95.5 chance to win that game over the Rams and yet they didn't so in many ways this says just as much about the 49ers as it does to the Rams because we know both of these teams were significantly beat up but the 49ers we saw them last year they couldn't come back from halftime deficits and we saw that again a week ago against the Vikings and now we're seeing them again choking away big leads late in the football game and one final thought is this remember the 49ers had beaten the the Rams nine out of 10 consecutive regular season games. Well, that's over. That stigma is over. There's a new Kin Can King in the Rim Ram room, and the name is the LA Rams. Oh, okay. I love I love the fire early on. And don't forget to give credit to Kyle Shanahan for being pretty good at blowing second half leads. Robbie, let's talk about the Cardinals. The way Jared Goff started that game for the Detroit Lions was pretty unbelievable. I'm surprised the Lions only beat the Cardinals by seven. Yeah, uh, Alyssa, I think I was set up for failure here. I have to follow Joe and Kyle like that. That <laughs> fire, that energy, I love it on the NFC West huddle here. Yeah, you said it. Jared Goff was basically perfect in the first half of that game, right? But then in the second half, the Cardinals' defense, they made some adjustments. The final seven drives of that game for Detroit, four punts, an interception, a turnover on downs, and then the final drive of the game where they were just kneeling out the clock. The Lions shut out in the second half. The problem was the Cardinals' offense also couldn't get much going in the second half. The Cardinals kind of had their get-right game against Kyle's Rams two weekends ago. We thought maybe that momentum would carry into last weekend against the Lions. And afterward, after that Lions game, you kind of had the talk of, well, the proverbial moral victory for the Cardinals, especially with the way the defense responded in the second half. Well, we know the Seahawks beat the Miami Dolphins handily 24-3, and a casual two-game lead over this NFC West division. I'm not trying to brag, but here we are bragging. We as reporters face some adversity here, having to say Mike McDonald versus Mike McDaniel all week long. That was a test of mental strength. But I like just going with Mick offense versus Mick defense. Mick defense won, and a lot of talk about how the Seahawks still haven't played a top-tier quarterback yet. But we have no idea what to expect about this team here in Seattle with an entirely new coaching staff and mostly the same roster. Well, we have seen for sure the tackling improve like crazy last year it was peewee football at times finished the season with the third most missed tackles i think facing the dolphins who love to get the ball to tyreek hill run screens watch him go was a legit test for the seahawks defense because mcdaniel hardly tested them with that kind of stuff they have the second most qb pressures do the seahawks according to pro football reference and then offensively the hawks went radio silent similar to what you talked about um, robbie with the cardinals they went silent for the middle two quarters and you kind of put that on the offensive line maybe geno smith because that was a problem last year too with a different offensive coordinator 
but they came back from the dead in the fourth quarter on a 98 yard touchdown drive to win the game. So I think we are seeing more of the Seahawks offense and defense come through and being able to be resilient and handle mistakes that they make early on because they're a new team and continue to win at three and O. Oh. I want to know how we're feeling about each team's stock value and some injury updates next. Kyle, how much life did a comeback win over the 49ers give a very battered Rams team? It gave them all the life in the world. I mean, Kyle Shanahan took that defibrillator and put it right on the heart of the Rams <laughs> and just jolted them right back to life, right? I mean, this is what the Rams needed. They needed to win this game, of course, to avoid that 0-3 hole that nobody recovers from. No one that's ever been 0-3 has gone and on to win the Super Bowl. So this was a huge win. And now you look ahead. And things get a lot better for the Rams because, listen, they're going to get healthy. Cooper Cup is already out of his walking cast, and uh, Puka Nakua is now wearing just a compression sleeve on his knee. And that offensive line is going to get healthy again. And now you look ahead. They go to Chicago to take on Caleb Williams. And you know the struggles he's had early on in the season. They come home and they take on the Green Bay Packers. And we don't know what the status of Jordan Love will be at that time. But then they take on the Raiders team, which is an absolute joke. After that, they've got uh, Minnesota, the Vikings. That, of course, will be teacher versus the student and Kevin O'Connell. And, of course, you know, Sean McVay knows all of his tricks. And then we take on your Seattle Seahawks, which uh, no offense. Alyssa, but I mean, come on, you've beaten what? Bo Nix, uh, Jacoby Brissett, and the Tua Tunga Vailoalis <laughs> Miami Dolphins with Skylar Thompson. Are you proud of that? Hey, listen, you have to play the teams that are on your schedule. I get it. I get it. But that 3 0 is kind of a joke, it, really. Oh, a joke. Okay. Well, I will say kudos to you for saying Tunga Vailoa list. I mean, his last name is already hard enough, but <laughs> we will get into this because I want to know what everyone else thinks. And I, I admitted it. There's no guaranteed wins with this Seahawks team, but the fact that they're still beating teams that they should beat, uh, should they beat them? We didn't even know heading into the season. So I think that's fair. I will admit they have not played a top tier quarterback yet. We will find out a lot more about them when they go to Detroit. We will talk about that. Joe, I want to go back to you because I never gave you a chance to, re to rebuttal uh, either what I said or what our new buddy Kyle <laughs> said in Los Angeles. I want to give you a chance for that and also an update on Christian McCaffrey and please do it in German if you can. Yeah, you got it. No, uh, Christian McCaffrey had to miss four games after they put him on IR, so he's not going to be uh, back on for a couple of more games anyway, if in fact he is healthy. And as you said, he went to Germany to explore some type of potentially uh, experimental treatment for the Achilles and calf. So who knows about that? And I don't play a doctor on TV, and I don't pretend to be one as a broadcaster either. The one thing that I will say, and, and now that Javon Hargrave is out for the season as well now, uh, one of their key defensive linemen, and the defensive line was supposed to be one of the strengths of the 49ers, but it sure didn't look like it in the second half against the Rams. But the one thing that I will say about the NFL schedule, it is it is so – I would not put any stock in, oh, who the opponent is, and you haven't played anybody good yet. A win – is so hard to come by in the NFL week to week. Uh, you cannot project what's going to happen looking forward, injury-wise, opponent-wise, who the other quarterback is. If you look at the 49ers in the opening game against the Jets on that Monday night game, they look like they picked up right where they left off last year. Then they go to Minnesota. Then they lay that terrible leg against the Rams. All of us, Arizona looked like it was an elite team as it completely dominated the Rams. Then they're a completely dangerous team the next week. Nobody saw the Seahawks at 3-0 and right now. Here's where I think we gauge the season, and I'm talking from the 49ers perspective right now. They've got the Patriots at home on Sunday, then they've got Arizona at home, then they've got Seattle at Seattle in a short week. Let's gauge where they are after that. If they uh, win two of those games, uh, they're probably two of those three, they're probably back where they expect to be. If they lose two of those three, their season's in trouble, and there's no way we can project that until let's check back. What would that be? Uh, two weeks, a little more than two weeks. That'd be exactly two weeks from now, wouldn't it? They'd be getting ready for that Thursday game in Seattle. So let's say uh, the Thursday after that when we next speak. That was, that's where I would say you get a pretty good gauge where you are in the season. I will say this, and what the Rams really did avoid doing, and as you said it there, uh, nobody's ever gone 0-3 and been a, a title contender. So they avoided that. 
Uh, and if, if I'm in L.A. right now, I'm saying thank you to the 49ers for missing a field goal, for special teams breakdown, for letting them get a first down on fourth and six. All those things that you can point to for thank you, Ronnie Bell, for dropping a pass that was in field goal range right in his hands at about the 20-yard line late in the game of a tie game. So those are all part of football. And those are things that bit the 49ers, no question about it. Uh, yeah, last Joe, uh, Joe, your fruit basket is on the way. It's, it's in the <laughs> mail. That should be coming any day now. <laughs> well, they gave you guys one uh, uh, on Sunday. Uh, Christmas came early, so I hope they appreciated the, uh, the basket that the Rams got. All right, you guys Certainly. are being too nice to each other. We have to change this up. Um, I, I do think that we almost <laughs> just became best friends, though, Joe, with giving compliments to the Seahawks and saying maybe this is a real thing. It's hard to win in the NFL. Robbie, I want to go to you and bring you back in to this. Is the Cardinals stock down, or does it stay neutral after a loss to a good Lions team? I'm actually going to go the opposite. I think the stock is still up for the Cardinals. If you consider kind of the larger expectations going into this year, there was a lot of question marks when you looked at this Cardinals defense. There was question marks on the offensive side too, but at least we knew the talent on the offensive side of the ball with Marvin Harrison and James Conner, Trey McBride, Kyler Murray back and fully healthy. Defensively, we had no idea really what this Cardinals team was going to be capable of, especially when they lose B.J. Ojolari and then Darius Robinson goes down. How are they going to generate a pass rush? Well, so far through three games into the season, they're averaging giving up about 21 points per game, which I know that's not great. You're not going to win a Super Bowl because your defense has given up 21 points per game. But the way this offense should function that should keep the Cardinals in pretty much every game. The Cardinals should be able to put up 21 points per game with the personnel they have on the offensive side of the ball. And it's not just me that has reason for optimism with the way the Cardinals have played through three weeks. After the loss to the Lions, Kyler Murray was actually still fairly upbeat. Usually after a loss, Kyler is pretty despondent, doesn't answer, he answers questions, but not a lot of energy at the podium after a loss. And I get it, nobody likes losing games, right? But after that Lions loss, he actually said he saw reason for optimism with the way this team and the offense specifically was functioning. And if Kyler's optimistic, then I'll remain optimistic. I think that's completely fair. And you're going to have ups and downs. And Lions defense, I mean, who knows what to think about them right now, but it could be a very proved to be a very good defensive team down the road. I know their secondary is really good in particular. Um, I want to quickly mention with the Seahawks against the Dolphins, their stock is obviously up. But we don't know what's going to happen with our defensive line. We saw Leonard Williams, Big Cat, as we know him, um, and Byron Murphy, the second, their first-round draft pick of the 2024 season, leave the first half in the game against the Dolphins. They did not return. We don't know anything about their injuries other than general locations, rib, and then uh, with Byron Murphy, the second, it's a hamstring. So that could play a factor in their next game. But right now, I think the Seahawks stock is still up because their depth was proven on the defensive line with Derek Hall, Mike Morris, several other guys stepping up, and Boye Mafe really coming into his own um, in his third season. It's now time for fair or foul. I'll make a statement, and each of you will tell me whether you believe it will happen by saying it's fair or foul. We're going back to the Seahawks. They're the kings of the division right now. And I want to know how long each of you think that will last. By Christmas time, the Seahawks will still be at the top of the NFC West. Robbie, we're starting with you. Fair or foul? I think foul by the time we get to Christmas. I still think the 49ers are the class of this division when you look at the amount of talent on this roster. Truthfully, though, as we've talked about a lot so far in the show already, injuries will tell the tale here. Christian McCaffrey can come back and be healthy. If Brock Purdy's back doesn't flare up anymore and he can remain healthy and continue to play at a level that operates that Kyle Shanahan offense, I just I think the 49ers, they have too much talent on that roster to not get back up to the top of the division by the time we get to the holiday season. Joe, what do you think? The Seahawks will be at the top of the division by Christmas time, fair or foul? I wish you had asked me that question after the game in Seattle. Uh, there will be three more <laughs> games under their belt. At that. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say foul right now too, only because of the same reasons that Robbie said. That's still a loaded roster, even with people uh, injured. George Kittle's supposed to be back soon. Uh, I don't know exactly what the the Debo uh, situation is, but if you get all those people back, they have certainly in the conference the best playmakers in the conference. But uh, 
injuries are such a key thing, and it's such a cliche to say that, but they've been struck by injuries from the beginning of training camp, and it continues to seem to bite them. It always, it's always interesting to me when people say, you know, you lose a Super Bowl, and they say, oh, don't worry, we'll be back again next year. And there's no guarantee that you're going to be back next year. There's entirely different personnel, different roster. People get hurt. The 49ers were relatively healthy last year, and it is a cliche, but injuries play a big role in all of this, and injuries have, have not treated them well in the early part of the season. But I would still say that their talent, if you look uh, position to position, has got to be the, the strongest of the four teams. No, that's completely fair. And when you're on the other side of it, when they're relatively healthy, like the Seahawks are for the most part, I mean, no one has really been ruled out for the season yet. And there's like different, there's several guys that could be on that list. Abe Lucas, Echenna Nwosu, um, Leonard Williams. They all could be technically out for the season, but none of them have been. So you kind of realize the fortune at that moment. Joe, uh, Kyle, I want to go to you in Los Angeles. I kind of feel like I know your answer here. Are you going to continue the hate on the Seahawks? I, well, I, I wouldn't call it hate. I wouldn't call it hate. <laughs> we, we love everybody here in L.A., but I'm not only going to say that this is foul. I, I'm actually I'm going to write down the percentage chance that the <laughs> Seahawks are on top of the division by Christmas. Uh, it's exactly wow. 0.0% wow. chance. Not going to happen. I'll just, they won't be in first place in about four weeks because they've got Detroit. That's an L. You'll beat the Giants, then you lose to the 49ers, the Falcons, the Bills, and the Rams. That's four out of five games that's actually five out of six games you're going to lose in the in the near term and i agree with joe i mean the the class of this division remains the 49ers and the rams if you look at all the injuries that both teams are dealing with right now you get all of those guys back that joe mentioned you get puka nakua you get cooper cup you've got the offensive line jonah jackson back uh steve avila this rams team is going to be good the 49ers are going to be good they're both going to make the playoffs this year the seahawks will not the Seahawks won't make the playoffs? They That's what won't. you're saying. Okay. Hey, uh, Seahawks fans, Kyle Kraska's Twitter, at Kyle Kraska. <laughs> <laughs> go talk to him when the Seahawks make the playoffs. Uh, Bring or it do on. something. Maybe. Let's go. <laughs> Maybe it'll get you some more followers. You don't need it, but I'm sure it's always fun. Um, I love the spiciness here. This is great. Final topic. We're looking ahead to week four. Robbie, what are the keys for an Arizona Cardinals win at home against the Commanders? How optimistic are you feeling? Are you like Kyler Murray? Optimistic? Yeah, I would buy stock in Kyler Murray in the Cardinals this week because, yes, Jaden Daniels and the Commanders are coming off that big win over the Bengals on Monday Night Football. Jaden Daniels had three total touchdowns in that win, and he only threw two incompletions. Can he do that again two weeks in a row? I'm not so confident the rookie quarterback can do that two weeks in a row. And for the Commanders defensively, they're right near the bottom of the league right now in points given up per game, yards given up per game. This sets up perfectly in terms of what the Cardinals kind of need a bit of a get right for this offense. They should be able to get James Conner rolling. Once he gets rolling, that opens up the play action. It opens up the downfield passing. That's what we saw happen against the Rams two weeks ago. There's just so many storylines in this game, too, with Jaden Daniels, the former Arizona State quarterback, coming back to the Valley. Cliff Kingsbury, of course, the former Cardinals coach, now the offensive coordinator for the Commanders, his first time back at State Farm Stadium on the other sideline. I also thought it was interesting this week. The Commanders have actually, they've been in town all week. They've been practicing at Arizona State leading up to this game. I guess they just enjoy 110 degrees in September, and I can't blame them. You know, it's nice. You just walk outside, you immediately melt, get a nice sunburn instantly. It's great. It's perfect. No, who would, who would not want to go on vacation and completely burn um, in September? Record level <laughs> temperatures, as you were telling us, in Arizona. That is crazy. Same thing here in Seattle, obviously, about 110 degrees in the northwest. Um, Kyle, the Rams go to Chicago and face the Bears on Sunday. What is the main focus of the Rams to win there? How optimistic are you? Oh, very optimistic. They're going to win this football game, no doubt. And uh, the Rams just have to remember that the only reason that the Bears even have one victory on their record right now is because of their special teams and their defense, who each scored in that week, week one uh, win. So Caleb Williams, they just can't let Caleb Williams suddenly become the Caleb Williams who won the Heisman Trophy. And you can't let him turn into Bo Nix. Remember how bad Bo Nix was in the first two games of the season and suddenly the Broncos go down to Tampa Bay and Bo Nix turns into Joe Montana? They can't let Caleb Williams do that if he continues to play poorly. And we don't wish anything 
horror uh, on Caleb Williams because, hey, he was right here at USC and we were cheering him on as a Trojan and we love the fact that he came here and won a Heisman Trophy, but he has struggled mightily so far in his young career and he just needs to do that one more week and the Rams just have to go out there and Matthew Stafford has to be Matthew Stafford. Remember, those are two number one overall picks going head-to-head this Sunday. Uh, do you realize, though, that when Matthew Stafford was selected number one overall, that Caleb Williams was seven years old? Huh. Wow. Wow. Seven years old. I was going to say, there's probably quite a bit of a year gap in there, but Matthew Stafford looking great. I mean, he looks like a young, a young buck. Um, interesting with the line with USC and Caleb Williams. It's going to be hard for Rams fans to root against Caleb Williams, but that might be one of the most disappointing teams in terms of how much hype they had at beginning the season. And we had Roma Dunze from Washington uh, with the Huskies go there. So interesting to watch that game. Joe, San Francisco looking to forget everything, everything that happened last weekend. They host the Patriots Sunday. How optimistic do you feel? Well, they better win that game. You know, they're coming off of consecutive road losses. Uh, back at home for the first time since the opener against the Jets. Against a, a bad Patriots team, unproven quarterback. Uh, the one thing they did not do against the Rams, you know, they had the Rams on the rope. They, they were ahead 14 to nothing. The Rams had a fourth down, then they got momentum by converting that fourth down. And they, they were still heading that game 21 to 7, and they still gave the Rams life. If they get ahead in this game, they need to put their, their re respective uh, foot on the, on, the, uh, on the Patriots' neck and just say, okay, you, we are not going to give you optimism that you have a chance to get back in this game by giving up big plays, by giving up special teams mistakes, things like that. So if they end up 1-3 and three with losses, with that uh, ugly loss to the Rams and losing to a Patriots team, they're going to start questioning where their season's headed. So they, they better win that one, and I do feel optimistic at home. Uh, that they will win that game before then playing two very crucial in-conference games back-to-back -back, Cardinals and Seahawks after that. All right, Joe choosing violence there was stepping on the neck of the Patriots. I think earlier when I was shocked <laughs> that Kyle said that the Seahawks weren't going to make the playoffs, I had to check myself afterward because it is kind of surprising to me that I'm that confident in this team so far. 3-0, I think that's impressive, but the offense really hasn't shown enough yet to really be a believer, make me a believer. They have all the weapons. DK Metcalf has, is already having his most productive September since 2020 when you look at catches, receiving yards, and touchdowns. But JSN, you want to see him get in the, more, in the mix more consistently. I think against the Detroit Lions when the Seahawks go there on Monday night, and since 2010, the Seahawks have the highest winning percentage on Monday night football since 2010. So that bodes well for them. This is going to be a high-scoring game, just like it has been the past two seasons. Geno Smith has had two of his top three best games since he became the Seahawks starter in 2022 against those Detroit Lions. Last year, he had an 83.3 QBR. The year before that was 91.4. So he has to be that kind of Geno Smith. And then defensively, they have to shut down the Detroit Lions run game. What a scary two-headed monster in Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery. We will see what happens on Monday Night Football. The Seahawks looking to go 4-0, and and I'm sure all these guys are confident that they will. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to all of you on the NFC West Huddle. Thank you for your time, except for Kyle. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We appreciate your time. Come back next week. We appreciate you all, and we'll see you next week.